Do you have a poem or a limerick, Mom? A limerick. Um, well, the ones I know are rather naughty, so I don't think I can. <laughs> I don't think I can say them. Hey, ladies and gents, boys and girls, you might have noticed that since the last time we were together, since the last time we spoke, the world's gone kind of completely insane. And so that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today with one of the leaders of the resistance. One of the leaders of the resistance on the right. My guest today is David Frum, leading conservative intellectual for the past 20 years and who recently wrote an article for The Atlantic magazine where he's a senior editor entitled How to Build an Autocracy that's gone really quite viral. Even my mom shared it on Facebook, which basically describes what is happening right now to the institutions of democracy under Trump in the United States. I really encourage you uh, to read it. But we're going to talk about David Frum's whole life. He's a really interesting guy. So as I said, uh, leading intellectual on the right um, for the past 20 years, who uh, before he became Mr. Anti-Trump on the right, was probably most well known for having written the Axis of Evil line in George W. Bush's 2002 State of the Union address. He was a speechwriter for Bush uh, for two years. Prior to that, he was a journalist at the National Review and the Wall Street Journal. And in fact, he is the son of Canada's most famous journalist probably ever. His mother was Barbara from an absolutely iconic journalist in Canada who I remember listening to on the radio on the CBC when I was very, very young. And so we had time to talk about all this because David Frum was nice enough to give me quite a lot of his time at his house in Washington, D.C. This is an extremely busy man, especially since this article has gone viral. I mean, he's leading the resistance. He's very busy. We do the interview. Goes great. I go to check the audio. There is nothing there. First time it's happened in 10 years, and obviously it had to be now and not when I was interviewing drunk teenagers at Glastonbury. So there's nothing there. I had obviously bought a Trump-branded SD card for my audio recorder. Long story short, I had an epic meltdown on the side of a lonely road somewhere in Virginia, then got up the courage to email David Frum again and beg him to give me some more time for an interview, and he was just so gracious about it. He gave me an hour and a half more of his time. Now, you'll notice that this part of the interview is only an hour. There will be a second part where we talk about the role of the media in the age of Trump and how he, David Frum, came to be persona non grata at Fox News. In this main part of the interview, we talk a lot about his life, about his mother, about how he came to develop his political philosophy. We talk a lot about Iraq and George W. Bush and, of course, about Donald Trump and, uh, in David Frum's own words, how this man is building an autocracy. So David Frum graciously welcomed me into his home just outside of Washington, D.C. again and uh, started off by introducing me to his two dogs. Now, if you hear any uh, dog panting noises, those are uh, David Frum's dogs. What are they? What are they? What are their names? Uh, uh, one is the darker colored one is Chester, and the lighter one is Safi. Chester is the psychologically needy. He's the one who's knocking the, my, my arm right now <laughs> and is trying to spill my coffee in my lap. He just—he's very—he's very needy. He's very needy. Are they named after anyone political? Uh, no, Ch- Chester is, uh, is named after uh, a vet who. Um, actually saved the lives of the um, the, the dam when the uh, babies were being, or the, the puppies were being born. Oh. And um, Safi is just a name that she, um, my daughter came up with. That, uh, Safi's a nice name. Yeah. A nice name. Uh, so David from this is like take two. Take two. This is take two because I had the, um, the worst disaster maybe of my life. I hope that will be the worst disaster of your life. I was going to say. If you never have a worse disaster, you will have a very happy life. I mean, that, that, that's true. I mean, although we are uh, in, in the Trump era and maybe World War III, so if that is the worst disaster that happens to me, that means that the Republic is saved too. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had a huge journalistic disaster? Oh, so many. Really? Which was the worst? I don't know that I can qualify them as, as, as the worst, but I, I, um, I've missed planes. Um, I've... Uh, I, I've made mistakes in print. Um, in the olden days before the internet, when you made a mistake and you had to wait 24 hours for the con- correction 
to appear in print the next day. That was the longest oh, 24 hours. And if you made a, presti- a mistake in a prestigious place where people would see it, it that was excruciatingly uh, painful. Now, someone who seems to me to have not made many of those is your mother, yeah. which is one of the reasons why she is such a, a legend in Canada, literally a legend for those who aren't uh, Canadian uh, to give them a sense of how, how respected and important she was. If you go to uh, the headquarters of the Canadian Broadcasting Company, there is like a whole wing yeah. dedicated the, the to her, a whole atrium dedicated to her memory. She was also a, my favorite fact is that she was a Muppet on, on the Canadian right. Sesame Street uh, entitled Barbara Plum. I don't know how old you were when she was a, a Muppet on Sesame Street. I, I, I was not young. I rem- I, and we have actually um, uh, the poster of the, the Canadian Sesame cast with, with the Barbara Plum Muppet. Um, she, was very, I mean, she was very young when she started. She was very young when she had me. She was young when she died. She was 54 when she died, and that's two years younger than I am now. There's a story, just, there's, there's one story we tell about her, we remember about her, that sort of illustrates her approach to this. Um, what, um, phone rings one day. It was back in the days when the phone rang and people went and answered. The phone rings and she vanishes from it's a, vanishes for a while and we're out on, on the, the little deck enjoying uh, the warm weather. And she returned and um, my dad, what was that? I said, oh, that was um, Visa Canada. They, they uh, called. They want me to do some commercials for them to be a, a spokeswoman for them. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, they had an offer for me. And my dad, impressed, said, well, what was the offer? How, how much money did they offer? I said, oh, the conversation didn't get that far. Oh, awesome. I thought I could not <laughs> admire her more, but and, that, and her, that's I, right I, there. It doesn't matter. What, I just, the answer is no, I won't do that's it. That's awesome. I don't, and she, would, she never did advertising. She would never promote products. Um, and she wasn't interested in knowing what the pay was. She just wouldn't do it. And, well, I mean, and that's, that's the idea that Canadians have of her and, ha, and have kept uh, uh, of her now. Like one of the... Um, uh, shows that she founded, as it happens on CBC Radio, is still a show today, and and right. people still remember her, and they still remember her um, famous uh, interviews. She was uh, one of the first to interview Nelson Mandela when right. he got out of. Uh, but the the power of the interview, what they were doing was so novel that now we think the interviews are important because of who was interviewed. But what was actually the breakthrough was how they were interviewed. It was by phone, right? It was by phone. It was, so and this, this was, was new. This, this was, was new. completely new that you could, if you were willing to compromise sound quality, which was a big shock, instead of sending somebody out, inviting somebody into a studio or somebody, sending somebody out, as you're doing now, with headset and microphone to interview them in a place with good sound, you just get them on the phone and accept that yeah. although the sound may not be so great, you will get something live. And one of the classic interviews was in the middle 70s, there's a confrontation between England and Ice, Britain and Iceland over some fishing rights. And they got the British consul general in Reykjavik on the phone. And he's talking about the situation. It was a very tense situation. And then there's this strange noise. And he keeps saying, I, ha- I have to leave. But the way the phones worked in those days, the caller controlled the, the line. So if you hung up on somebody, you couldn't make your next call unless the caller... <laughs> Hung up. <laughs> and of course, in those days, people had relatively few lines. So she's on the phone with the British Consul General in Reykjavik, and he's saying, Madam, I have to end the call, but he doesn't have the power to end the call because unless she agrees to end the call, the call is not over. <laughs> and she's just one more question. And then there's this terrible sound. And, uh, and she says, What's that? And she said, That, madam, is the sound of my windows being smashed. Now may I call London? <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic, and it was great radio. It was too. great radio, but you, but you could just do, and it was it was new. This was started in 1971. People had not done this before, mm-hmm. um, and radio also had in the 70s a power that TV didn't have because again, people forget this. TV cameras were big, honking, expensive pieces yeah, of machinery. Until CNN, you couldn't be anywhere in the world live. Right, you couldn't. Uh, I mean, people remember Vietnam as the living room war. What they forget is the way Vietnam was. You would send a camera into the field. They would film the action. They would then seal the film in a metal container. They would drive it to Saigon. They would put the film on a plane from Saigon and then fly it back to New York. So you would see live battlefield footage, but you would see it four days after it happened. <laughs> right. um, the idea that you could be there immediately, which we now take for granted, was something you could only do with radio in the 1970s. And as it happens, uh, was the pioneer of that. And all things considered, on American radio is a copy 
of the format. Right, the, right. As it happens, was the real uh, the, the the innovator right. of all of that. And as the name tells you, as it happens, that was. Um, yeah, and you felt it, and we were in Canada, and you could you could hear the whole was a real, world. You that was know? a real promise. And um, so, one of your mother's other very famous interviews was with Margaret Thatcher, and this is one I want to ask you about too, because yeah. you being a, a famous conservative, although although I do know that you uh, campaigned for the NDP, the Socialists in Canada when you were a, a, a teenager, yeah. a fourteen, uh, for which you say that that was just. That, that that wasn't out of ideology. That right. was- I didn't know anything. No, I, that was uh, the fun of being on. I wanted to be in an election. I'd seen a movie about it or something. And this was a friend of my parents who was running um, in um, West Toronto for the provincial legislature. So I was able to go out there and, and, and knock on doors for him. Um, uh, that's that was. I've been on a lot of campaigns, but that was the first one. So uh, even though you campaigned for the NDP, that was that did not um, su- well, I was, I sway was, you. Well, I was I was still in a very formative. I mean, I was fourteen. But what what had a big impact on me, and one of the things that really was formative, was um, uh, my mother had given me for a birthday present the the just issued paperback edition of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. I think only the first two volumes. Were so, so the major uh, uh, work on on the Soviet uh, concentration camps. Uh, yeah, and we were we. Had, were a family that had been heavily touched uh, by the Nazi Holocaust. This is obviously a very sensitive area for me. And um, my route to the campaign was a bus ride, a subway ride, another subway ride, and then a streetcar ride. So I had an hour each and you way. Would, you would read it on this. And so okay. I'd read the long book. And, it, and, the, and this book made a huge impression on me, and I can still see its pages in my mind. Um, and... I was I was working in a as I said I was working for socialists and I was working for people who were uh, I mean everyone now reveres Solzhenitsyn but at the time this book was considered by some people a provocation that and right because there was still a lot of uh, I mean you know Trotskyism and, and right. all that was still a big thing at, it, at the it's time it's a big thing on this particular campaign and so I began having some pretty heated exchanges about the mm. book and th- it was those that became an enduring. Uh, political influence on that. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay, and then so so this was, um, I guess, solidified some of your your leanings more towards a co- conservative well, or non socialism. No, no, what it led me to, um, so like the the bedrock point of view, um, and this was something I. So you know, my especially my father's side, but on my mother's side as well, we had seen, you know, uh, in the Nazi Holocaust. So my my father's parents migrated to Canada in um, 1930. He was born in 1931. Um, had they not come in 1930, my, my father had been born in Poland in 1931 and grown up there. He would have been murdered at the age of 11 in 1942, as when most of the Polish Jews were. Um, in my, my, fa- um, my father's father had six siblings. Half of them were murdered. Both his parents were murdered. Um, so like so, any Eastern European Jew or any of it has this um, family tree with just pages ripped out of it of all the mm-hmm. people who, and you have the sense of the near, you know, the near miss that if my, if Saul Fromm and Rivka Fromm had not come to Canada in 1930, had missed that opportunity and stayed in Poland, they would have been murdered. And my father, who was born in 1931, he would have been murdered, um, and I would never have been born. And so you're very aware. Of, uh, and you become interested in that subject. Right, so and you read that whole book in a much different way. You read that, and then what you also realize is, why do things like, and I, why do things like this not happen anymore? How do you stop mm. them? Mm. The world doesn't order itself, and so the, the bedrock condition, the bedrock view, and this is, I mean, the foundational view of my politics, um, is the most important thing, is the preservation of a decent world order, and that is underwritten by American power. Um, it doesn't happen by itself. The con- most, and, and the, the, because the United States has this, it's not like Americans are better than other people. They're obviously not. They're the same human beings everybody else is. But this, the United States has had some uniquely favorable historical circumstances. It's got a lot of land. It's got a lot of wealth. And it doesn't have dangerous neighbors. Right. We've got Canada, Mexico. There's not and, a and lot And the two of, oceans. Right. So what that means is both the country doesn't have to plunder others to get rich. And it has so much security. And it's so strong, it can export security to the rest of the world and make the rest of the world not have to worry about providing for security for itself. And this maintaining this order is the most fundamental thing of all the things I believe. And which and, is one of the one of the things that has uh, 
one of, one of the dangers of now is that that has maybe that order has existed for so long. It's that, under attack, and it's under attack yes. by the president of the United, the current president of the United States, mm. and and uh, among the many reasons for believing that he is unfit for this job by temperament, by character, by um, intellect. Um, the thing that is most sinister about him is he said that, that this order rests on two principles. Um, that, one, the United States will provide security to other people so they don't provide it for themselves. Um, and, two, that the United States will underwrite an order where they all trade freely with each other so they don't get they, – they, they prosper. But they also understand that their neighbor's prosperity is their own. So um, I don't think – you know. So there's, no ger- need, there's no need for them to build up their own army. Yeah. If I'm Germany and you're Poland and I'm mm-hmm. making cars and you're making wheat and I'm hungry, I don't think, why didn't I invade you and take your wheat? <laughs> I say, well, I'm not, first, I'm not allowed to have an army really anymore, right. so I can't yeah. invade you. And secondly, the Americans have taught me that actually selling you the car and buying the wheat is a much happier arrangement for both of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, and, but all of that, so that rests on a trade order, on an economic order, and a security order, and it's all underwritten by the United States. And in the absence of the United States, it won't exist. Um, and Donald Trump's trade and security views are attacking that. He has this idea, um, and the people around him have this idea, that if you, if you just break apart Europe and liberate all of these nationalisms, they all exist together in beautiful harmony. It's Serbian nationalists and their Croatian nationalist well, that's brothers. That's always worked so that's, well, well, hasn't it? Russians and Ukrainians, Germans and Poles, they'll all be nationalists mm-hmm. together. And everyone in Europe is saying, it doesn't, we will tear each other apart. Uh, yeah. And I have we to admit, know. Yeah, I have to admit that before um, this year, um, having been someone who'd lived in Switzerland too, which is outside of the EU, has a very unique history. Uh, I, I, I didn't understand a, a lot of my French friends' view of the European Union as a project of peace. For me, it was just, well, it should just be trade, you know? Yeah. And now I understand a lot more um, the importance of, yeah. uh, of, the, of the Union as maintaining peace. peace. But it is, it's worrying. There was a, a poll recently that came out by Ipsos Mori uh, showing that this was uh, the research was done before the election, so maybe it's it's changed a bit before the American election. But showing that eighty percent of French people were in favor of a strong leader willing to break the rules. Um, right. you know, the UK and the US were only at about fifty percent. Germany was at only twenty percent. They were right. at the bottom of the list well, for some reason. There, there's a, a little. There's a German comedian named Jan Bonnermann who's very ch- charming and funny, and he he did a satirical song and a year ago about Donald Trump and others, Erdogan and so on. And the, the best couplet in the song is, uh, maniacs with crazy hair, yeah, 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 we have already been there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the Germans... That's the not Germans, bad. Is that the one, is that the guy who got in trouble because of he... Of the Erdogan poem, yes. Yes, and then they got, they, because there was this ridiculous uh, law still on the books in Germany that you couldn't uh, insult a foreign head of state or something. Right, exactly. And they've gotten rid of that. Right. Uh, uh, they've so, abolished it. Right. And so, uh, so I imagine all this uh, way of thinking that that um, that that uh, America for you is the one that maintains this world order was also a reason why you were a big Reagan um, yeah. supporter. That that world order, uh, the, the last time that the world that world order was in much danger as it is now was in the late nineteen seventies, and um, President Jimmy Carter, a very decent man in a lot of ways, but he just he just didn't wasn't equal. Well, Maybe one of the Personally, as a person, one of the most decent men ever to yeah. have been president. Yes, and an exemplary former president. You know, didn't cash in, has devoted his life to charity and good works and helping people and um, continues to teach Sunday school at the age of 90. Um, it's just an amazing thing. Um, but he didn't have the vision and the strength to uphold this system. And he didn't. He was not good at the job of being president. He didn't know what one of the most important things about being president is to know all the things that are not your job. Um, you know, it's funny with Ronald Reagan, there was a lot of questions, how could an actor be president? But one of the things that a movie actor knows is being an actor is a big job. It, it's enough. You don't also have to be the producer. You don't also have to be the director. You don't also have to be the writer. You don't also have to be the sound man. And when they don't yeah. need you, it's your job to go back to the trailer and have a nap. Uh, Which describes Donald Trump. Kind of like to a T. Just no, comes not, out. You but don't he does, think he so? does the wrong thing. He doesn't because the point is 
He is the guy who is so busy fidget, uh, telling the sound man how to do the sound <laughs> that he doesn't get the nap and okay. then sleeps through his call at, you know, because they, they say we have to take this thing at 540 mm. when the sun comes up and he's sleeping through it because he was so busy doing all, all the things that are not his job. That he doesn't and do he's, it. And he's staying up watching Saturday Night Live and yeah. getting pissed off about it. And... The, the reason presidents don't watch TV, don't watch TV news, first up because it's, it's irritating and distracting. Yeah, and, uh, famously Obama never. He's, like, he'd rather put on the basketball game. They watch, they they watch yeah. sports. I mean, Truth Bush. What they do, in fairness to them, they get a, a package. It, or they don't have to watch it, but if they want, the staff will make them a package. It's 10 or 12 minutes long right. with okay. the main clips just so, so you know, up to date. so right. you know what other people are seeing, mm-hmm. but you don't. Wa- first, it's a waste of time. Second, it will make you upset. Um, mm-hmm. You're busy, and uh, and it's also if you have free time, you should rest, uh, and you should be with your wife or your children. You should you know replenish your human energies. Yeah. Um, well, and this is something Obama again seemed very good at doing. Obama was very disciplined about that. I mean that that you know the family didn't. and George Bush was also very I mean he had his exercise time W, w George W Bush but by the time he was president his daughters were out of the house they were in college but he you know he had his exercise time and he made lots of time to relax and you know watch sports which he found relaxing um, so he could be focused on the job and the job is very the job is very very taxing and Donald Trump he's just not he, he does all the things that aren't the job and he doesn't do any of the job uh, do you even think he wants – do you think he wanted to really be president? I think he wanted to be president. I don't think he wanted to do the presidency. <laughs> I think that's a very good analysis. So uh, let's go back, go back to your days where you're uh, – so in the 80s, you're a big uh, Reagan supporter. And coming back to your mother and her, her interview with Margaret Thatcher. Oh, yeah. Which was quite um, – I watched it. Uh, quite confrontational. I think right. even you described it that way. Um, it, it, and you must have been a huge Thatcher supporter I, at this time. I, I was I was there in person for the Where's interview. You? I watched it and I got to meet Margaret Thatcher, but which was a huge thrill for me. But Thatcher had um, a fault, which was she could be very pedantic. And mm. the reason that interview went so badly wrong was... Oh, but I watched it. I thought it was one of the most fascinating interviews yeah. I'd seen with her, though. How, but, however... But Thatcher objected to the way my mother was asking a question. I and, could tell. They and, clashed. And, per, and, they, yeah. they, and, they, and, and they clashed in all these definitional things. And Thatcher got pedantic. And my mother got frustrated. And so um, Thatcher wouldn't answer. And my mother was then not able to reset the interview in a way to move it on to a more fruitful Right. I, she tried a couple of times. People listening to this, by the way, should go watch it. It's available on yeah. YouTube. And, and uh, Thatcher, uh, at a couple of times, your mother does try to steer the conversation to something else. She's like, no, no, wait. And that's yeah. actually what I found fascinating about it is because you got a, a certain sense of uh, a different side of Margaret Thatcher's personality. She, got, was, she was a bit unsettled. You got the sense of the, the thing that eventually brought her down was yeah. um, that – and this happens to you when you have power is you become – over time, you, you, uh, you get rigid. I mean, one of the things, it's like working in a nuclear power plant, being a politician. You just, in a nuclear power plant, you absorb radiation. No matter how safe the plant is, you will absorb, and, and eventually you've absorbed enough radiation, you have to leave the plant, uh, or else you, your health is impaired. And that's what happens. They, eventually, they just have to go, because mm-hmm. um, if they don't, they'll go a little crazy unless one of the great system the only only reason presidencies are seen as successful is because they you can only be president now for eight years if presidents Mm -hmm. were allowed to hang on for nine or ten or eleven if they could they all would and then they would all end in failure in canada by the way do you think that was one of stephen harper's uh big mistakes mistakes. because because had someone else run uh so people who aren't canadian are listening to this stephen harper was prime minister for a long time um before uh, trudeau and ran again and and they lost despite the fact that he'd weathered the recession quite well for Canada. Yeah. And if a, con- I think if a younger conservative taken over, they might still be right. in power. I say newer, not younger. The problem was mm-hmm. with how, I mean, he was still a relatively young man by politician standards when he lost, but he, he did that one election too many. Mm-hmm. And what, ha- what happens to anybody is first, we're all products of our time. We, we sharpen our political skills in one, in one environment. And then in office, the political skills dull because you have other things. You have, you have an administrative and governmental job, um, and you stop being contradicted, and you lose the people who knew you when you were not important and who could tell you you're wrong about things. <laughs> you're surrounded by people who think you must know what you're doing, and so you. you uh, my wife Danielle has a wonderful phrase about um, 
how it happens if people get ri- if are rich enough or powerful enough or successful enough or if women are beautiful enough. Uh, they move outside the feedback loop. And suddenly they are no longer well informed about themselves. And then they make terrible mistakes. Interesting. That's an interesting lesson, but I don't think that even if you know it, when you're in power for that long, if there aren't limits like in the United States, then, I mean, Donald Trump, someone's typically, if there's he spent no his whole limits, life outside he would the spend in, in his entire life. So, okay, so you're, uh, what was it like, by the way, meeting uh, Margaret Thatcher? What did you think of her in person? Oh, I was awestruck, of course, but, um, uh, uh, but I, I was a little... I was a little embarrassed because I was, I, I was so admired her. I so wanted her to do well in this environment. And then she was at her worst, not her best. <laughs> and, and so, so I, I looked a little foolish afterwards. It was your I, mother I'd that been promoted. <laughs> I, you know, she's just the most important figure in British politics since Winston Churchill. She's you know, the saviors of Western civilization. And then she's just, uh, in the interview, she's just this, um, uh, she wasn't very charming in, she that, wasn't very inter- charming. in that interview. And, and then actually something happened. Yeah, I remember this. This is one of the little things that happened. And then two or three days after that, there appeared in one of the Canadian papers a story about me in this context, which was not only a total fiction, but which was the precise opposite of the truth. And, and I still bump into it from time to time. So a, a, a journalist who had been, because there were a lot of people there, right. journalists who had talked to one of them said, so I had watched this thing and I come away from it feeling embarrassed because my political heroine had not, had performed so poorly. With your mother. With my mother. And then somebody, then there appeared in a print, somebody had this story that said, I had said to one of the cameramen, my mother has had that coming. As if A, Thatcher had won the, com- won, had won this yeah. Set to, and B, that I had been happy that my mother had been. Ooh, that's pretty, that's terrible. And, it's ter- and it, was, it was a total invention. And, and yet I, it still shows up. And it, it just reminds me about something, about just a, 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 one of the things about, that these stories come into circulation. And you have to be really careful with them because. Yes. Um, Always. Uh, I, I heard you say something about the news too. And when you, when you were asked about what source is reliable or not, and you just say, just assume that no source is reliable and check your facts. Unless verified. Unless yeah. verified. Yeah. And so, well, we can um, put that one to rest right now yeah. that you never said that. Yeah. So, we're, um, and, but, and this is true of a lot of famous anecdotes that, um, uh, and a lot, of, and of course, all the quotes you see on, you know, I, uh, you know, I, uh, I mean, I, the, the, this is now its own little internet meme, right? The internet, the internet is full of invented quotations. Dash Alexander the Great. Right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my favorite ones. Um, so, uh, skipping forward a bit, um, you're asked to be go from being um, so you're, you're 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 at Yale and Harvard, and you go to National Review and the Wall Street Journal. You're a journalist, and then asked to be part of. Yeah. The administration of the George W. Bush administration. Did you hesitate? You weren't even you weren't even American at this time. I was not an American citizen. So this was um, late two thousand, and I was invited to join the speech writing staff. And I hesitated for a lot of reasons. Um, I hesitated because I wasn't sure that I wanted to go into politics and leave journalism. I hesitated uh, because I didn't know about um, speech writing, which I'd never done before. I hesitated because I'd not been a huge supporter of. George. I'd been a big I wanted John McCain to be the Republican okay. nominee in mm-hmm. 2000. And I, I am not ashamed to admit, I hesitated because I thought the job was a little beneath my dignity. I was offered, it was an assistant speechwriter job. And, okay, and all right. So I'm, I, I'll be candid about that. My vanity was a little, you know, not You gratified. were like, my office is going to be how big? Right. I'll be, what, in a oh, I had a great office. I had oh, a, did you? I had a great office. I'll okay. tell you about that in a moment. I had a great office. But... Um, and I talked to someone who'd been in government for a long time, and he said, look, no one is ever offered the White House job they think they deserve. If- <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, take, take the job. You will never be sorry. You will learn in those two years more than you will learn in the rest of your career. And that was, that was true. Now, my office was amazing. Um, and- <laughs> <laughs> what was so amazing about your okay. office? I'm so, curious. Uh, I was in the executive office building, which is that big Victorian pile across the way from the White House. Okay. Um, and I had this huge room with like 16 foot ceilings, uh, which then had this um, sound baffling. It was it had been divided in two, and on the other side of the little sound barrier was Matthew Scully, who um, was, was the most talented of all of the writers and became a good good friend. Um, Matthew Scully later he's a, he's a, an animal rights guy, and he wrote a beautiful book called Dominion about animal rights. And um, when my wife read it, she said, 
this book sounds exactly like what George Bush would sound like if George Bush were a crazed animal rights fanatic. Because <laughs> it was a combination. Matthew had the Bush cadence. Sounds really weird. Better than anybody. But he also, he was a vegan and he wouldn't wear a leather belt. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and um, no, it was, it was and. Uh, you know, we, we were we were in this prime location, um, and it was it was a, it, the office was fine, uh, and the experience was really interesting. And indeed, you know, it didn't matter what your formal title was. Uh, that okay. in fact, you, sort of in, in you did together. the work. You know, you, you got to see the work of the White House. You understood how government worked. You got to spend a lot of time with the president. You got to see how he worked. Um, and George Bush was v- very aware of his inarticulateness, and he saw. Oh, and he, okay, was he? And he wanted. Well, he to, did make that joke about himself at the correspondence dinner about not being able to pronounce nuclear, right? You know, and that kind of thing. He had, um, he has a, a, an impairment, which is the opposite of dyslexia. So, um, dyslexia we're all familiar with. It's a processing disorder on the way in, right? You can be a highly okay. intelligent person, but you, but when you look at the letter E, you see the number three. And that makes it hard for you to read. Mm-hmm. So he had the opposite problem, which is he could read very easily, but he had a processing disorder on the way out. And so he w- the famous line about him saying misunderestimate, right. he, that was a tick. He would re- endlessly insert extra syllables into long words. Uh, and that, but, that, just, the way, of all, just the way dyslexic sees three for E. That is insane. I had no idea about that. So when you wrote for him, you had to be aware. You had to use, you had to use short words, not because he couldn't pronounce a long word, mm. but because if he saw, if he, if he were speaking, he would say underestimate without trouble. But if, he, if it was on a teleprompter, uh, he would mangle it because, uh, because he would read it properly, but, out of, but he would pronounce it wrong. So that every time you wrote a speech for him and then saw him read it. You must have had sort of your heart and your throat being like, please no, don't No, because write, I, I knew write. how to work for it. I, I knew, make the words short, which by the way, you should do anyway. Um, but do you think this is one of the reasons that people thought he wasn't, you know, there was always that accusation that he wasn't a very smart guy or what was your uh, impression of him? He wasn't like an intellectual. No. Um, I spoke to somebody who went to Andover with him. And so there are two misconceptions about George Bush. One is that he's dumb and the other is that he's nice. And, <laughs> and Wow, the second one all, all seems because, to me Because what he did was he played this shuffling Ronald Reagan genial person. Right. But in fact, he was a very mistrustful person. Oh, really? Very wary, very shrewd. So he, he, no, he was no intellectual and he was not the most brilliant man ever to be president. Um, and he didn't have that kind of amazing Bill Clinton recall right. of everything. Uh, but he had, um, he could read people. And, um, and, one, um, and one of the reasons the Iraq war experience was, I think, so painful for him was he had misread some of the people around him. And he relied on things that turned out not to be true. What, like Dick Cheney? Yes, among others. And, and, and so he realized that. I, he, and I think he, he realized that he was he was in a trap, and he had fallen into a trap that he. Had, and when did he realize this? I don't, that I don't know. I would I would have already been gone, but. Um, he, he, and he had um, built an ineffective staff system. I mean, a lot of the, the like he uh, he had a weak chief of staff and a weak national security advisor. And those are the two points where the government is brought into unity. And uh, so he had, a, he had not made a system where you were forced to confront bad possibilities. Because one of the okay. things you have to ask mm-hmm. is, okay, maybe this will all go as smoothly as everybody's saying. And there's what, no one in the room saying, but this could happen. Right. And the people who were saying it were not, were, would, be, would be shut out of the process. I, like, okay. And so, so well, but while you were there, what was your view of all this? Well, as so often, I had never been in government before. So, um, when Dick Cheney said, and the people, and the people around him said, there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Of course, I believed. I didn't have a security. I should stress, as an, I was not a. For, I, was, I remained a Canadian citizen while I was in the White House. I think I may have been the only person in history to be a for, to be not a dual national but a foreign national in the White House. But one of the consequences of that was I couldn't have a security clearance. So I saw none of the materials myself ever. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was always reliant on what other people thought. And I, and I had a bias, which is the people who I, in my opinion, had been right about the Cold War 
Which is very important to you, because, yeah. you know, our, regarding our, our previous were, discussion about the world order and everything. So these are the people that you really, you thought had gotten it right. I gotten it. They were the people who were for the Iraq war. And the people who were against mm-hmm. the Iraq war, the people who had insisted we had to, you know, find a permanent, you know, way of getting along with the Soviets and that the Soviet system was here to stay. And it was reckless of Reagan to think that you could ever see the end of it. Uh, they were on the other side, by, okay. with some exceptions, but by and large, that was true. And so I said, well, the people I trust are on one side. The people I don't trust are on the other side. I don't have access to the raw intelligence. I don't have the competence to evaluate the raw intelligence if I see it. I mean, I can't tell if this aluminum tube is for a rocket or for something else. Um, uh, and, and I think George W. Bush was a little bit in that situation. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. of, of relying on people. But, uh, uh, but as a difference, you, you told me previously that um – this was the one issue for you was the uh, weapons of mass destruction. You didn't yeah. believe in this uh, war as one of um, the regime change. Well, I, I believe, like, I do believe that the United States should help to bring about better regimes when it can, but you don't fight wars for that. So, um, you know, Saddam Hussein is this terrible, monstrous dictator. So all in favor of, um, for that reason, sanctions on him. Mm control the access flow of weapons. If there are better people in Iraq, give them various help of kinds. And I'm, you know, I'm give them clandestine help. Um, I'm, I'm all for those kinds of CIA operations. One of the things I've enjoyed about the Trump era is watching, you know, my liberal counterpart suddenly discovering why you need things like the CIA and the national security agency. Um, you know, they're, they're glad somebody's listening to the Russian phone calls and just dis- detecting uh, Michael <laughs> Flynn and his lies. Um, but you don't fight wars for that reason. That's not a good. That's not enough of a reason to. Um, and you certainly um, don't fight wars of choice for that reason. So it's interesting that you think all that because because of the one phrase that you helped uh, write, you are forever associated as uh, one of the one of the names. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, it's it's a, it's a very complicated it's a very complicated set of dilemmas. I mean, just to be funny about this in a Washington way that. Uh, the um, one of the things I could say when people say about this is I could stress how not important I was, but they think you don't want to overdo that because people might actually believe it, and then they would realize, yeah, you you weren't very important. And in Washington, being thought unimportant is much worse than anything else. That's yes, like the worst that, thing that's they the can worst say about thing. you. So, uh, uh, so, but I but more seriously, what I also believe is, yeah, I, I supported the war. I was to the within my sphere, I was um, somebody who um, wrote speeches and did things to but, hey, bring it about. And so you have to, as I said before, you have to live up to the choices you've made and accept accept their consequences. So and I, you uniquely, I, I heard you in a previous interview just a year ago, call uh, Iraq a mistake, say people who are in, uh, involved in its design should face penalties, you know, yeah. uh, and you said, including me. Yeah. I've never heard anyone... Um, say that about the Iraq war more generally, I think yeah. in politics about well, any decision. If, if you make a major ju- misjudgment, um, when I say, I mean, it should have career consequences. Um, and, uh, that, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why Hillary Clinton is not the president right now. Um, that, cause she couldn't talk. She, she, she really didn't talk about it. Yeah. And, and while Donald Trump certainly lied about his, his view of Iraq. I mean, he had been for it. The fact is, um, he was not a decision maker of any kind. She was in the Senate and she cast an affirmative vote when she could have cast a negative vote. And that's the reason she wasn't the Democratic Party nominee in 2008. And that's why the Democratic Party, that's one of the reasons the Democratic Party resisted her. And why she had such a um, primary battle in 2016. And that primary battle, I think, really crippled her uh, going into the general election. And, and Donald Trump, because when Donald Trump used that Russian spy material, um, published by WikiLeaks, which is, for all intents and purposes, a, a Russian agency, that the strate- his st- political strategic plan was to sharpen, was to depress turnout among Democratic, the Democratic mm-hmm. left among Bernie Sanders supporters. Well, and it worked. And it worked. And that, that, that absolutely worked. And, and coming back just to a detail that I found interesting, I don't know if it's completely true about the, the, the famous line, the axis of evil line, you actually wrote axis of hatred. Yes. Not evil. Yeah. Well, I wrote, the way it was in a... Um, the 2002 State of the Union, the way states of the Union, they're written in sections and they're written by different people. Um, and then they're bolted together. Uh, they're kind of, they're big rambling monsters. And so, uh, 
um, in going into that speech, I wrote a big section on intelligence, which hit dropped on the cutting room floor. I wrote a big section on agriculture, which hit the cutting room floor. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> uh, it's because this is where the president is. And we we actually we, the agriculture bill, the farm bill, was up for renewal. Uh, that year, it's a five-year thing, and we do. So I wrote a section on. So if someone else had made a choice, you would be the farm bill guy, today. right? Well, we cut, no, but you write these things, understanding that. Mm. I mean, the speech can only be an hour long, and people write all these, and everyone's battling to get the president to commit to this or that thing. Uh, so I wrote this. So I had written this section about, um, you know, what's the case for extending the war to Iraq. Um, so I made the best case I could in about four or five paragraphs, and then. Uh, a collapsed form of those four or five paragraphs with some revisions then becomes the, the axis of evil section. But when I, I wrote it, um, uh, I wrote states like these and their terrorist allies, but I didn't name any states because, believe oh, it or really? not, okay. speechwriters do not get to decide with whom the United States is going to go to war. <laughs> yeah. um, so I set up a verbal frame, mm. you know, States like these, TK, 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 you name them. I mean, that's obviously not my level of responsibility. Um, and then which states are going to be named, that is, made at the, that is a decision made at the senior most level. But, but what, one thing that does, uh, um, that detail actually, uh, um, I find interesting, though, that, that hatred was turned into evil because evil is a very... Um, a, a, a word that you don't use lightly when you're okay, president but, of the United States. Okay, so w- w- one of the reasons we backed into that kind of language was in the early days after uh, 9-11, the question was, what were we going to call the people who carried out the 9-11 attacks? Right. Um, and that turned out to be a really complicated question because the word had to work in English and it had to work in Arabic and it had to work in other languages too. And uh, so... You had to avo- avoid, uh, so you couldn't call them jihadists, because that's a good word in Arabic. Um, you couldn't, uh, if you called them terrorists, that, all, that had bad as because every Arab government calls its domestic opponents terrorists. Mm. So that's a kind of meaningless word. Um, and we went through a whole bunch of things. And, the, uh, and then somebody hit upon the, like, uh, so in Arabic, there was a word for those who sow needless hatred. And it's like the opposite of jihad. It's a very, very bad thing in Quranic. Arabic is a much more flowery language than English. And when you back translate that word into English, you get evildoers. And, okay. and then, but that then worked with some of our you know, evangelical Christian supporters. And so the, the, the George Bush began using the phrase evildoers a lot to describe these people, thinking you know, then when you put this into Arabic, it will sound like something that will work in the Arab world as well. And, uh, and, and, and we had a lot of sort of very Christian people, you know, and they liked it too. And so that, that language tended to spread. It's interesting the amount of thought that goes into it, it goes though, in, and, in, and in different languages. But the problem, of course, is in English, it's too hot. It is, yeah, yeah very, our, our, very. We prefer it to, seems sinis- sinister to use it sometimes. Yeah, it seems, it, it just seems, I mean, our, our preferred language you know, um, you know the uh, in, you know the greatest French military statement of defiance. You know, uh, said by Marshal Pétain at Verdun, is "They shall not pass." Okay, and an, and the greatest American statement of defiance, General McAuliffe at the Battle of Bastogne, when called on to surrender by the Germans, he said, "Nuts," <laughs> <laughs> and. and like, you know, they shall not pass sounds great in French. It sound, in English, it sounds a little yeah, yeah. a little much, where nuts would sound just completely coarse and vulgar. They shall not pass seems, seems a bit like Monty Python. Yes. Like, uh, yeah. So we, yeah. we like a sort of blunter and you know, yeah, you know, yeah. more downbeat way of phrasing things. And so, yeah, so anyway, so axis of hatred, my, the point of that was to say, because we were answering this question, how is it possible? Now, today, this is all you know, common knowledge. But back then, it seemed very controversial to say, uh, you know, the Iranians fund Hamas, which they do, and which was that, at that point a state secret. And people said, that's not possible because the Iranians are Shiites and Hamas are Sunni. So, of course, they won't get along. Well, but it's happening. So it must be possible because it exists. Um, and so, uh, um, 
so uh, what I was trying to convey was that the, all these different groups may hate each other, but they are bound by their common hatred of the United States. Like the Axis during like the, World like War II. The, right. The, the, Germany, the Germans thought, according to Nazi ideology, the Japanese were subhuman. They weren't Aryans, mm-hmm. uh, but they were still able to cooperate against the um, Americans because they, they shared a common enemy. So that was the idea of, the, of that phrase. That, but what's more interesting now is that you can just talk about it um, – by saying, "Oh well, now I think that was a, a mistake," and, and I don't think that phrase. I think I, no, not I, the. I mean, uh, I mean the the war. The the, the war was um, the war. The war was a, a concatenation of mistakes. At first, we went into it on false premises. We thought there were weapons of mass destruction. I am Bush believed that. I am certain. I don't know whether Cheney believed it, but Bush believed. It. Um, uh, then we bought the most optimistic scenario about what would happen. So we had only enough troops uh, for the most favorable circumstances, and we did not have a really good plan to stand up. We, we assumed we would inherit a functioning Iraqi state that could be turned around and put to our own purposes, and it didn't. The state collapsed. Um, and then we had no ability to police the country um, in, that, that descended into um, you know, the Saddam Hussein's tiny little Sunni military clique had inflicted a lot of atrocities on the Shiite majority, and they then wanted to take revenge. Uh, and nor had we understood, by the way, well, there, anyway, there are a lot of fault lines in Iraqi right. society. And we, just in every case, we bought the best case scenario, and we got instead the worst case scenario. And, but what's interesting is that you're just having this conversation and, um, you know, with just simple facts and talking about it, and that it seems impossible for the GOP to well, have it's this there. Things, uh, so, I mean, one of the things that when you look at the Trump campaign, I, I, I see it in sort of the Freudian terms of the return of the repressed. That in Freudian ideology, uh, mental illness, neuroticism is caused in the following way: there's a trauma in early childhood; um, it is repressed rather than dealt with. Uh, and, but the retress, repressed always returns and manifests itself in hysterical behavior. This is not a true description of mental illness, but it's a very powerful literary idea, and it's a good description of what happened in the, in the Republican Party. There was a trauma. No one could talk about it. It manifested itself in hysterical behavior, and then Donald Trump was the Freudian psychologist who said, we are going to bring this into the light of day. And then when he mm-hmm. brought it into the light, he transformed everything. Absolutely everything, and, and, and which brings us to your article now, which has been... Uh, a huge success um, because people really believe that we are in danger of yeah. um, of becoming an autocracy. Uh, we're, we're, again, I want to. I think one of the reasons the article worked for so many people was it didn't present an overly dramatic view of what's happening. You know, I, I'm not. That's pre- what's scary about it. It's it's like because you start with a scenario in four years. Where we've just all been sort of lulled into yeah. submission. Right. That I don't think, you know, he's going to be able to, Trump will be able to corrupt the courts, and I don't think the FBI will carry out illegal orders. Um, and I don't think, obviously, we're going to have a military coup or anything like that. But what we, we will see, we are seeing it now, is a slow corrosion of American institutions. Um, the habit of official lying, which is growing up all around us. Um, the um, ab- abuse of... Uh, the president abusing um, his power to enrich himself. Uh, and then the use of social media to mobilize troll armies that work to intimidate people. Uh, obviously, I mean, as I said, the FBI will never, ever harass a journalist for printing a story the president doesn't like, but the president doesn't need the FBI. He just needs to tweet the person. And, and they do that. They name journalists. They name journalists or they name um, uh uh, the union head, the head of the union logo uh, in Indiana, and then people will show up at these people's yes. houses. And people, armed people in get some death, cases. death threats. People get death threats. They leave their houses. And the d- target of these things doesn't care that the death threats come from people who aren't on the government payroll. Right. Well, they, 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 they just they use the masses. The, the, that the inflamed troll arms. The, and, the, and, and, uh, and the Trump people are consciously building. This is the thing they have learned from the Russians. They are building troll armies. Um, they have independent sources of funding. Um, and uh, these, these, uh, the Anti-Defamation League did a study of anti-Semitic twi- tweeting and found that they did a sample of 50,000 anti-Semitic tweets and discovered they came from just 1,800 accounts. And 
there's relatively small number. And those 1,800 accounts, by the way, that doesn't mean 1,800 people. It may be men, individuals often have multiple accounts. Uh, but they, what they do is they can create pressure on people and fear. Uh, you can do that with a relatively small number of people with a little bit of money. And they're, they're doing the same uh, thing in France now. They do the same thing. And they target women especially. Um, there was a, uh, an Estonian, I think, no, it was a, it was the Russians, I think it was a Finnish or Estonian journalist who'd written a story about Russian corruption. And she, again, she was just driven out of journalism entirely by the obscenity and threatening quality of this uh, tweet barrage that she you got. You even have a, a colleague at the... Julia Yaffe had yes. this. Um, and uh, she was, she'd written a story about Melania Trump that Melania Trump had not liked. And again, she was subjected to the most obscene. Um, and people did show up at her house. And Melania Trump, when asked about this, encouraged. I mean, that, 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 this is where it comes into view. This is not quite accidental. Melania Trump said, well, after all, she did bring it on herself. Which is insane considering Melania Trump's uh, one issue, which she said that she was going to bring up... Um, was cyberbullying. But what, what, what that means is criticism of her. Of and her. her, and her. Uh, she, the, the, the Trump people have, n- uh, they have no conception of that ethics apply to all of the human race. They are perfectly capable of doing something to somebody one day. And then when they get, the, like the president will say, you know, they'll go on television and say, um, uh, we need to respect the office of the presidency. And as for that judge, he's a, he's, he's, he's a bum. You think the office, we respect the office of the presidency for the same reason and to the same extent that we respect the judiciary. And if you're telling us that we don't need to respect people whom we disagree with, that also applies. To, and, but I mean, this is childish, and yet they don't think of it. They think that, that they, there's a special set of rules for them that entitle them to respect and um, deference that they extend to nobody. Well, that, what I think is interesting about that, too, is that I think that in that way he reflects how a lot of um, people think these days. I mean, this whole language, even before this election, about wanting to break the system, break the establishment. People, yeah. I, I don't think, are only becoming now that they're being so abused, becoming aware of what the institutions are we, that, we, that we protect live, democracy. You know, um, I, I, one of my in my senile decrepitude after Peter jokes is uh, that this phrase first world problems I live in the first world what kind of problems do you think I'm going to have um, that we have grown we live in a society where the rules and the norms and the institutions have worked so well for so long that we are complacent about them dangerously complacent about them uh, there's a line of G.K. Chesterton's a great Catholic apologist who um, urges never take a fence down until you know why the fence was put up in the first place. And when people say, I want to burn the system down, these are people who, whose parents lived in a functioning system, whose grandparents lived in a functioning system, and they don't know what it's like to live with systems that burn down. Um, they, what they imagine is you'll just have uh, better rock and roll. Um, but <laughs> people will... Might, that might be an upside. People will... will take machetes to their neighbors and chop them into pieces. That is inside the human heart. And making us civilized, that is a giant project. And when you have a degree of civilization, you protect it. You don't risk it. This article actually started with, uh, wasn't going to be about America. It was going to be be about 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 Hungary. Hungary, Which is a place that is going backwards. And all through East Central Europe, you see things going backwards. You see it going backwards in South Africa, um, which, you know, which had this amazing transformation under Nelson Mandela, but looked like it, it was Nelson Mandela's was the personal leadership was the thing necessary uh, to make it work. And, and, and South Africa, although better than most states in Africa, is sliding away from democratic rule. You see it in the Philippines, which is sliding away from democratic rule. Um, we're living in a period where um, a lot of things that we thought were permanent achievements of humanity are being de-achieved and it's terrifying and and people in highly developed countries are not exempt it's happened it is happening in the united states it could happen in france um you know the germans may be exempt because of their experiences are so recent and so painful right. and, and um and what they saw is I and mean, to be a little cynical about this i mean i'm sure they're very very mindful of all of the terrible things that they did they're also very mindful of the, 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 the afterwards, their cities were reduced to rubble, <laughs> right, yeah. and and they said, "Okay, well, you know, we people can forgive their, you know, can forgive crimes more easily than they can forgive the memory of, you know, I we personally had to live among rubble." Well, well, and you also say in this article and also in the teaser for it that the 
the Congress, which is supposed to be a check on the president and which is controlled by the GOP, will not. They will be his ethical bodyguard. Polarization has meant that whereas Congress used to uphold its privilege, its prerogatives as a body against the president, today Congress functions only as a check on a president of the opposite party. And this is becoming more intense in every cycle. Um, Congress was fairly independent. A Democratic Congress was fairly independent of Bill Clinton in 93 and 94. But the Republican Congresses under George Bush and the Democratic promises under Barack Obama, they did what their guy wanted. Um, and it's, now it's even more extreme with Republicans under Donald Trump. Um, and the only hope to change that is to make those members of Congress so afraid of, that they could lose their seats, that they begin to do what they should, should do just as to uphold their duties um, as legislators, which is to oversee the executive branch and to prevent the, the president from abusing, abusing his office. And you even, you even know some of these people who are n- just no longer doing their, their duty, yeah. but who, who crossed, they, crossed over. Like, you worked for Giul- Giuliani yeah. in 2007, 2008. He seemed... I know a lot sane. Of, he I seemed know, sane. I know a lot of these members of Congress, and many of them have private and inward misgivings, but they're scared uh, because um, the, Donald Trump, while unpopular in the country, is popular in the party, and he dominates the conservative news media. And the conservative world, um, uh, it's a hi- hierarchical world. Uh, it's a world with a lot where um, a lot of command structures that don't exist in the rest of American society really function. And um, people have to be very careful. Even or feel com- they do. But, but there's that. And then there is people, though, that go 100% like Giuliani. Yes. Uh, well, there's, there's and also- Conrad Black also uh, on TV Ontario. It was on TV Ontario last night uh, saying something weird, saying that Donald Trump was such a polite man, then was confronted with the fact that he confessed to uh, serial uh, sexual abuse of women. Then he said, oh, everybody does that. All, you know, all guys talk like that. It's... Bizarre. It is bizarre. Um, but what, what happens with, with Giuliani and people like that is that Donald Trump has a p- particular appeal to people who are filled with rage and resentment. And you wouldn't think that someone as successful as Rudy Giuliani would have any reason for rage and resentment, and yet, and yet he does. And maybe, maybe hormonal and biochemical. I mean, one of the personal effects for me of the Trump era has been to make me much more afraid of getting old than I used to be. And I, I think I've joked to you, made this joke to you before, but um, you know, I think we all need to alter our living wills to empower our heirs. If they catch us watching cable TV for entertainment in the evening, <laughs> take us in the backyard and hit us with a shovel then and there. We have outlived any good we're going to do on this earth. It does seem, I mean, like... People who used to seem, you, you didn't agree with them, but they still seemed sane. Even Newt Gingrich now just seem like they're like. I think people, people need to talk to their children more, or, or, or older people. And you, because your children are ambassadors from the future. And if you find your views are straying too far from those of your children, um, you, you need to ask whether you've just lost touch with, with the world as, as it is. And um, you know, I, 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 it's a great source of not only pleasure, but reassurance to me that I find that my children and I, we, our views largely align. And when they don't, I really listen to them. I mean, on, on issues where, uh, you know, an issue where I've changed my mind uh, on the gay marriage question, the, the single largest influence on me was my own children. Um, wow, and, that's interesting. And, you know, listening to them talk about the world in which they lived. And, and I was not describing, I was describing a world that was passing, not a world that was coming. That's interesting that you have... <laughs> Just you seem someone like someone who has their own principles, but is willing to change your mind as well. And you have to change your mind because the world changes. And uh, Machiavelli says somewhere, "This is the tragedy of man that the world changes and he does not." That that's an that's an amazing that's an amazing quote, and maybe that's why you are one of the only people only people in in, in conservative public life that I know that actually voted for Hillary Clinton in yeah. order to do everything you well, could to so. stop Trump. They, that, that said so. I, I know, said I know so people publicly. who did. I know people who did who just don't want to say so. But, but I went through the mental game in my head saying, going from everyone from Bernie Sanders to Ted Cruz saying, who would I vote for in order to stop Donald Trump? And right. I would have no problem doing it and saying it for any yeah. of them. Right. Well, as, um, you know, uh, we have... The, the fun, what needs to be the, the fundamental allegiance is the constitutional democratic system. And you have to protect the system first. And getting your way in the game 
is less important than upholding the rules of the game. And, and this is when you talk about changing principles. I and mean, one of the things that I think conservatism really means is you're trying – conservatives are people who want to protect things that exist. But, you, but by saying we will – as anyone who's ever built a sandcastle on the beach knows, you don't protect things that exist by insisting that they stay exactly as they are. Because that if you want to protect the, in a moving world, if you want to protect core things, you have to make constant adjustments uh, to what you have in order to protect them against change. Um, you know, uh, there's a very cynical version of this in a um, novel, The Leopard, right? um, an Italian novel, in which the most cynical character says, "Everything must change so that everything may stay the same." Uh, okay, that's a little dark, but. Uh, intelligent conservatives say, here are some things we're trying to preserve, and we have to adjust in order to preserve them. And um, just on that thing of, of having voted for Hillary Clinton, is that the first time you've ever voted Democrat? It's the first time I've ever voted Democrat, um, and I hope the last. But <laughs> I, I, Although I don't, um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I increasingly think that um, the most, the thing that would most decisively check Donald Trump are uh, major Democratic gains in the House in 2018. And I mean, little as I agree with those people on just about everything, um, it may, you know, it may be something we need to welcome as a way of, of restraining him. You did mention that your, your, your wife uh, and yourself voted differently in 2008. Yes. My wife, my wife voted for Barack Obama in 2008. I've written about this. I'm not giving away a secret. Right. And, and, and uh, uh, she, uh, we had a, I mean, amicable uh, discussion about this. And she said, I was, I was calling her to job because McCain was such a hero. And she said, do you, do you want to be the one to tell the grandchildren that you voted against the first black president or shall I? We don't have <laughs> grandchildren. <laughs> We're some yet. ways off. But, but um, you know, she, she was very just conscious of that in the flow of history. This was a historic moment. And, um, and something important and precious happened there. And although I think in many ways he was a, you know, I didn't agree with him. I think he left, he didn't defend the country enough. Um, and that's one of the reasons Donald Trump is pressing. There were things he could have done in the summer of uh, 2016 to signal the Russians that they'd better knock off these espionage mm-hmm. activities on Trump's behalf. Um, and he didn't do it. Um, nonetheless, I mean, there's something, there's, some, there's something cleansing about the fact that the country has, has done this and said that this most fundamental of all American traumas, you know, uh, it is signaled in the most emphatic way it can that race will not be a barrier. Um, and not to say that everything is now, that race has gone away or everything's equal, but it's demonstrated there is no limit. And no one had to be embarrassed by the fact that he was president of the United States in a personal right. way. Right, he was a man Never. of tre- tremendous dignity. Um, was he's alive? He's still with us, and he may be back. By the way, because he is what twenty years younger than Donald Trump and twenty points more popular. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so we we may hear from him again. And well, so, I mean, if we're going to throw all the rules out, might as well let him run again. Maybe yeah. I guess well, he won't <laughs> run again, but he will be he will be obviously organizing some kind of political force. That, that that's pretty clearly his plan. Okay, so just a couple of uh, rapid fire questions to uh, end this uh, interview, uh, Dave, from which you've been so generous to do for like a second time. Uh, ridiculously. Uh, did you watch the Lady Gaga uh, halftime show, I which, did, I, thank which you. I sent thank you. you? You you had a very subtle reading of it. Yes, that was uh, that was very interesting. And and, uh, so I sent it to you because in your article, after the one saying that we're descending into autocracy, which was like, oh my God, what's going to happen? You did write an article about how it can... Yeah. Can protest. So I, yeah, she, she, that's a great model. I mean, she really, I, I'm going to cite her now as somebody who's, uh, of a way of, you know, you work with people, you don't, um, you try to bring people in, you don't try to repel people. And, 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 and you work with the symbols they cherish, not against the symbols they cherish. And very specifically, you had said in your article, you, you thought the, the most effective way of protesting or the mistakes not to make were not to, you know, um, burn the flag and that kind of thing, but to, but to make it your own. To- make it your own. And, and don't let Trump go. I mean, Trump tweeted at one point, um, a flag burners should have their citizenship stripped from them, which right. is obviously completely illegal, unconstitutional and inappropriate. And then two people obligingly showed up in front of Fox News cameras at a Trump building and burned a little flag. And what them. did they show all day? They yeah. showed people. And of course, yeah. that's what he wants. 
he wants that to be the face of the opposition. Give him the opposition he does not want. Um, have, you know, having a women's march on Washington, you know, have the police women and the military women in the foreground. And if Madonna wants to do something exhibitionistic, tell her to go do it on her own stage, on her, on her own time, you know, have responsible people there. Um, and it's, uh, as I keep telling my protester friends, the more conservative you are, the more radical you are. Did you, did you join the women's protest, by the way? Because I thought you, I saw you said good things about it. I was at, I happened to be out of town that day, but uh, you would have, maybe. Well, I, I'm not a protest guy, um, but I, what I do when these things show up in Washington, I wander down and I chat with people. I'm not, I don't participate in it. I'm not. I'm, I, I'm here. I'm, I'm telling everyone to be a joiner. I'm just a deep non-joiner. <laughs> but I went to a lot of the Tea Party. I, I go to, I go to these things when, when I can, and uh, just get in contact. I want to, I want to get. And, a, it's, it's obviously non-representative. You're picking people at random, so you don't know that you're talking to the main, the center of the thing. But you get some flavor for what's on the mind of people. Who go to these and you things. did. You did tell me uh, beforehand that when you were protested in Trafalgar Square in, in London during the Iraq vote, because you had been um, you, you'd you'd been identified by, yes. by by some of the people, which was a huge protest at the time, and sort of encircled, and people started saying quite uh, at the beginning they were they were animated. Yeah, they, 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 they even they were, they said were, anti things to yeah, you. They were, they were pretty frank. And then, um, but you told them I'm going to stay oh, here? So uh, I, I was, uh, this was the, the day of the um, debate in the House of Commons and then the vote to, for the Iraq war resolution. It wasn't, they have complicated rules. It wasn't literally that. It's actually a vote on an adjournment, but it was understood to be a vote on the war. Um, and that evening, I, I went to Trafalgar Square. I was in the middle of this uh, giant throng. And, but it's a testament to how people can be reasoned with. So uh, yeah, it got, it got a little heated. It got a little angry. Um, and it got kind of, it wasn't massively large, but and large enough. There may be 80 people around me. Um, it's a bit threatening. It's a, it, was a bit, I, I, it was a bit threatening. And, um, and they were firing questions at me. And it was, a, so I, I dealt with them by saying, look, I'll tell you what, um, I'm, I'm going to take questions for 45 minutes and I'll answer anything you ask me as honestly as I can. And I sort of stood on the little lip of that big fountain basin and, um, and so they, they sort of backed off to give me room so they could hear. And then I'd be, they'd be, they, and the first questions were extremely hostile. Um, and then I tried to give them, as I'm doing with you now, a candid answer. Um, and then the longer we talked, the less heated and more intelligent the questions became. And the more they dealt with the comp, because it's still not clear what would have happened. I mean, is there are a lot of other things to say about Iraq that, um, you know, Saddam Hussein really was a terrible person and he very violent and he a terrible judge of risk and he did attack his neighbors and he had a long history of using weapons of mass destruction. Um, and the, the mood became more and more um, reasoning, mm-hmm. reasoning. Okay. And then uh, at the end of the 45 minutes, I said, I looked at my watch, I said, the 45 minutes are up and uh, I have to go now. And they parted to give me exit from the little circle, and, and a few of them gave me a, a little round of applause, which wow. was very nice. And, okay. And uh, and goes to what, what what Obama said too is that um, we should speak to each other more. This is, I think, the best thing he said in that farewell address is when you in, try to interact with people not on the internet but in person. And one of the things I really do admire about President Obama is, you know, obviously he has a high opinion of himself and he holds on to his views. Man, he can even kiteboard, and yeah. he wants the world to know him. But he will listen, and he will absorb, and he does, and he he will try to persuade. But he will he is, will also hold himself open to being persuaded. Mm. I also wanted to end on, on a question of what do you think that your mother would have asked Donald Trump if she could have him in an interview. Oh, that's a great question. I, I don't know because she she always she would work very hard in coming up with these incisive questions. Um, she always leaves in asking very short and very specific questions. Um, I know after the interview that what she would want to talk about is how much do Melania and Ivanka Trump really hate each other? <laughs> <laughs> because although my mother was a very high minded and okay. very noble minded figure, uh, she was not above a little after the fact gossip and okay. uh that the the trump family does seem like the monsters and i think she would have been fascinated by that well I, what about you say you sat down with donald trump right now what would you ask him 
I would not walk across the street to shake his hand. I would not sit wow. down with him. I do not want to talk to him. He's like, uh, I, what, what, is, what is the point of talking to someone who lies as a matter of habit and really of, of principle? Um, and, you know, Donald Trump, when I say this, right, Donald Trump lies a lot, but he does not lie about himself. He's shown us about that. He is very candid. He can't help it. He has shown us what he is. And the fact that this creature is sitting in the chair of Lincoln and Washington and Eisenhower and Reagan and the two Roosevelt's, mm. I mean, it's just, it's an unending source of shame and the ridiculousness and buffoonishness of it um, should not detract from how, how sinister and upsetting it is. It's like we're in one of those man of the high castle novels and we are the people in the alternative timeline and mean over there in the you know next dimension history is unfolding normally and um you know there's a dreary and uninspiring president hillary clinton who's caught up in all of the squalor little scandals that the clinton people are always caught up in and they're cheating on their expenses and um, bill clinton is giving a speech in abu dhabi and you know <laughs> leer leering at the daughter of the abu dhabi and interior minister um and it's normal <laughs> it's just like it's normally gross and now we are here in this thing where we are questioning the stability and endurance of American democratic institutions, the global free trade system, and the Western alliance. Um, and that, you know, what motivates me, what keeps me going is um, both my outrage at this wrong, the wrongness of this, but I'm not an optimistic person by nature, but over, since the article's come out and since the presidency has begun, my increasing optimism and confidence that Americans actually are standing up and they are going to put mm -hmm. a stop to this. And every day I see signs of that. And that fills me with pride. And these are people often I, I would disagree with about everything, um, everything political. But on this pre-political stand of um, should the president respect the Constitution? Should he respect the rights of others? Should he um, be an honest man? Should he... Um, refrain for the, from denigrating disabled people and assaulting women. Um, that's pre-political. We should be able to agree on that. That's absolutely true. I'll just end by saying that that, that makes me a bit more optimistic because as I told you when I came here for the first time ever in my life six months ago and having been someone who's always followed politics and just seeing the White House and, and Capitol Hill and, and, yeah. and the Lincoln Monument and everything it, it moved me so much and i just thought that these symbols of of democracy which i thought we we're going to live with for forever this is my life and and to come back now i just i didn't want to see any of it i've avoided even yeah. looking at it well i'm here because it's so depressing to me what you've just said makes me a bit more well, optimistic so I, I, as saying this um hope for the best prepare for the worst and expand unlimited effort on behalf of limited goals. David Frum, thank you so much for um, being so unbelievably uh, generous. Oh, really thank you. Thank you very much. So that was the incredibly generous David Frum. What begun as a journalistic nightmare for me ended up being, a, well, I mean, I thought it was a pretty good interview, but I'm not the one to decide on this, as usual, the one who has the last word and who will decide if it was any good or not is my mom. So uh, what did you think, Mom? I thought he was the most interesting, uh, erudite, uh, informed man I was hugely impressed by. And I think anybody who listened to him, Laura, would feel the same as I did. I listened to absolutely every word really and i thought that you brought out the most interesting things about him not just politically but about him as a person as well it was a fantastic interview i thought oh well good so i get a good grade from my mom again this god every time i'm like god is mom gonna savage this interview or not but you liked it yeah. did you, you better did, keep it up Laura. i better keep it up do you remember <laughs> listening to his mom on the radio well, I certainly remember her. Yes, I mean, who wouldn't who lived in Canada? I mean, I, 
anyone of my generation would all know who she was. She was a, I mean, she was an icon. What more can I say? She was an icon. So, I mean, he comes by it honestly, doesn't he? Not mm. to say that that happens all the time with their children, but... Do you feel more or less positive about the future after listening to that? Because I know that you read his article, Mom, because you shared it on Facebook. Yeah, I saw that you oh, shared oh, it on oh, Facebook. Oh, yes. I, I, well, I thought his article pointed out the most important thing in a very sober way. That's what I really think I want to say. That's what I liked about it was, you know, he pointed out how really the... Th- the fears that we have really could come about, even though we all say we, you know, we all say, how could this man be there? He's not intelligent. He's he's vulgar. He's well. I, all these words have been used about him, but the most important thing is it's you know it's quite long his article, and I would say people must read it to the end because at the end of it, you know, the point he made was that we have to care, and he makes that point with you too, doesn't he? Yes, he does. And it is the most important thing. And I, I think already we have evidence of that, don't we? Anyway, yes. we're getting off and not about him, but he was he, he represents for me everything that I would respect and admire. And what, what does that mean? Well, that, that he let me do the interview twice. Well, well, yes, as a matter of fact, yes. No, you laugh. I, that is one thing absolutely Absolutely, because he's a very shows. busy man. He is a very exactly. busy man. Exactly, and I and but he understands that these things happen to people. That things can go wrong, and he he in the interview he is self critical of himself, and he is so. I mean, he he's a very intelligent man. He so understands how things work, and he has uh, a view, you know a wonderful view he of how, what a leader should be all about. That's all. I'm not putting it very well, but I I, I just was hugely impressed by him. Uh, I'd love to meet him myself. I'm jealous. Oh, you're jealous. Okay. Well, then we, we have to invite David from round for tea, I think. Well, he can come and have tea in Switzerland. I don't think he'd mind that. And no. he can come with his wife and children and they can all have a nice ski, just like the, your, your little nieces did today. Oh, did they go <laughs> skiing today? Did yes, they do well? they did. They did okay, very good. well. They even learned to ski backwards. Okay. It's more than Granny can do. Well, their next fun uh, activity for today can be to listen to my David Frum uh, interview. They're seven and nine, right? They can read the whole article, listen to the interview. I think Six and eight, Laura, but that's all right. Six, <laughs> six and eight. God, I'm the best auntie ever. Um, <laughs> uh, so fan of that one then, Mom. Another, another box ticked. Really big box ticked. Okay. Big, big box. And, and, Super. And do you think uh, we're we're going to survive the maybe coming autocracy? It changes every day. Who knows? This is probably going to be out of date in an hour. Uh, I really think, I you, you know, remember my, my famous Christmas letter, Laura? I said at the end, you know, who knows what we're in focus, store for, but positive thinking. And I think... That's in, uh, by the way, for the listeners who didn't get my mom's famous... Christmas letter. First of all, I'm sorry, you're just not important enough. And uh, <laughs> stop, no, stop it, Lars. Stop second it. of all, you you did finish with with that line that um, hopefully things would go better. In uh, well, I, I think don't you think we've seen some evidence of that already? I mean, yeah. he's tried to do all these things. People really, they you know, people are decent, and I do understand why he, in a way, why he got there. We won't go into all of that because. David Fromm has already, you know, spoken about it all in far more erudite way than I could ever hope to. But I do think that people are basically decent and that people are good and they don't have respect for someone who behaves as he has or who, who, you know. uh, So I I do think that it'll be all right. It'll be all right. Thanks, Mom. I feel better about 